Today I'm at the old Golden Crown mine in the historic mining village of Thames in New Zealand. The mine was established in the 1870s and it's been beautifully restored and maintained by members of the Haraki Prospectors Association. They have an amazing array of steam-powered mining equipment and one of the few operating stamphead batteries left in the world. So let's go and take a look and see them fire up the boilers and find out how gold ore was mined and processed in the days when everything was powered by steam. The Thames Goldfield is on the western side of the Coromandel Peninsula on the North Island of New Zealand. In 1852, a prospector by the name of Charles Ring discovered a small patch of alluvial gold in Driving Creek near the town of Coromandel to the north of Thames. He claimed a reward for the establishment of a new goldfield, but the patch was soon exhausted and Mr Ring apparently only received a portion of the reward. Twelve years later, in 1867, gold was discovered at Thames in a quartz vein by William Albert Hunt, or possibly his brother Albert William Hunt. A gold rush ensued and dozens of gold-bearing quartz veins were discovered. The quartz veins proved to contain some very rich shoots, reportedly yielding hundreds of ounces per tonne of ore. The town of Thames expanded very rapidly, reaching a peak population of 15,000 people with more pubs than Auckland. Some of the original tunnels at the Golden Crown mine are still accessible and you can take a short underground tour to get an appreciation for the working conditions of the day. There be ghosts in here. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is Robert operating a, a cart and uh, he'd start working in the mines at about age 13 and by the time he'd been doing this for several years he'd build up enough muscle strength to go on and do the actual work on the face. Um, so this was their apprenticeship to work for quite a few years underground pushing carts in the dark. The gold bearing quartz veins were mined underground almost entirely with hand tools. You can see the chisel marks from where these miners cut this out in the 1860s, 70s, 80s. Now this is the other miner that happens to be still down here since the 1860s. Uh, his, his name is Thomas and so he's uh, drilling a hole ready to put explosives into. Hit it with a hammer, rotate it a little bit, hit it again, rotate a bit, hit it again and uh, gradually drill a hole and put the explosive into it and go away and set it off. Here's a bit of, better sample of the quartz. Okay, so that's a vein, a quartz vein, that, and that's the ore that they actually put through the mill, yeah? Yep. When gold was found here first, they actually found it as uh, quartz outcrops right at the top of the hills. And they burrowed down to find where, the, where it was coming from and uh, then built tunnels sideways. So that was a, um, a shaft going vertically. Four men could get into this cage and go underground in a vertical shaft. Uh, it's a pretty tight squeeze for four people. There was a piece of timber that went up the wall of the shaft and if the um, cable broke, these teeth would dig into the piece of wood and stop the, uh, the, the cart from dropping any further. So it's a safety device if the cable broke. Production continued until the outbreak of the First World War in 1914. It resumed sporadically after the war and saw another boom during the depression of the 1930s. But most of the mines were closed before the Second World War began in 1945. The most common reason given for closure of the mines was the influx of water beyond the capability of pumping equipment as the mines reached depths below about 200 metres. But there was probably a geological reason that the miners of that time didn't understand. The gold mineralisation at Thames represents part of a classical low sulphidation epithermal system. Those systems develop beneath geothermal vents similar to those that are active in New Zealand now. And that's reflected in the coliform and crustiform quartz textures seen in the ore. In systems of this type, the ore chutes typically have a vertical range of only two to 300 metres, centred on the boiling zone. Below that, the grade often drops off dramatically, even if the quartz vein continues. So I think it's most likely that the miners reached the bottom of the boiling zone, but didn't understand the geology of the system. The appreciation of the vertical grade zonation in epithermal systems would come 50 years later when geologists studying geothermal power systems in New Zealand discovered that gold was precipitated in the pipework where the water in the system flashed to steam. 
steam would also play a major part in processing of the ore. The rocks come across in rail carts across that uh, gangway across to the main building and they go through a jaw crusher and it would be driven by a steam engine and it has two metal plates that go in and out with just a crank just pushing them together and the plates at the bottom are quite close together so it won't go through until the rocks end up the size of golf balls and then they can be put through the stamper battery. The vein quartz containing the gold was processed using stamp mills. I often find parts of these relics scattered in the field, but this is the first time I've seen one fully operational. The sound of the mill with just five heads operating is deafening. And they're restricted to runs of two minutes at a time by noise regulations. But at the peak of the mining boom in the early 1870s, there were more than 900 stamp heads pounding away on the quartz ore in dozens of mills scattered around the town. Uh, this is the mortar box, which the, um, the hammers drop onto these feet or anvils. So the hammers are going up and down here and crush the quartz. The quartz are fed in from the back and gets crushed by these hammers. So this is the stamp out of the stamper battery and that's the main weight. It weighs half a ton altogether. And this is a shoe and a foot or anvil and they had to replace these parts every three months because they just wear out. They usually come in sets of five. But you can see how it's worn fairly evenly. It's partly because the hammers rotate as they're going around. It's a little difficult to see the process in the cramped quarters of the mill building. But Evan Lewis has made a beautiful working model that illustrates the inner workings. I'm uh, Evan Lewis. I'm a medical doctor in the United States, but I came over here in 2020 on holiday and lockdown came along. And so I had my 70th birthday and retired. Uh, my father had just died and left us his engineer's lathe, so I had to relearn how to use this lathe. And this was a project to do to relearn how to, how to use the lathe. Made YouTube videos about it as well, so I've got about 100 YouTube videos. So this is a, a model of a stamper battery. So the uh, cam rotates around, lifts up the hammer, and then the follower suddenly drops off the end of the cam and drops the hammer. So that's our next project is to get this stamper battery operational, but uh, this one works. The shape of the cam is actually an Archimedes spiral developed by Archimedes 300 BC and the advantage of it is that it has a constant lifting rate and that keeps a constant load on the steam engine. These cams make the hammers rotate so as the hammer is falling it's actually spinning at the same time so, so it's causing a crushing effect as well as a grinding effect. It also means that the hammers wear evenly. The hammers would wear out because quartz is pretty hard stuff. Now the other part to this is the um, feed mechanism. There's a big hopper behind here that uh, drops uh, rocks onto this little disc and as the machine running the disc rotates around and knocks the um, rocks off the disc as it rotates. It's operated from one of the hammers so once there's enough rocks underneath the hammer to stop it from dropping all the way the feed stops so it's a self-regulating feed mechanism. So here we have all the rock that's come through the jaw crusher feeding onto this rotating disc and then it's got a wiper blade on here which brushes it off the disc into the chute which goes into the back of the mortar to be crushed with the hammers. When people see this machine operating it's always got the screen across the front but with this model you can at least take the screen off. We can actually put a bit of rock in there and see if it'll crush it. Rocks are fed in through the back of the mortar box, crushed to the size of sand, and they come through this screen. Uh, they flow across some metal plates. Originally these metal plates are made out of brass called Muntz metal, about 30% zinc and 70% copper, and it was used for coating the hulls of ships to stop the barnacles from sticking on it. Turns out that mercury sticks quite well to this brass. So they'd have these polished brass plates and they'd cover it with mercury, and then the uh, gold that was coming out of the sand as it was crushed would stick to the mercury. And every so often they'd come along and scrape the mercury off and extract the gold. Pull out a lump of, of um, amalgam like this and put it in this retort and heat it up to about between 400 and 600 degrees centigrade and that'll boil off the mercury and leave behind a pellet of silver and gold bullion. And the mercury would come up here and we have a, we've got a water jacket here to keep it cool. And as it cools down, it condenses back into liquid mercury and drops off into the little bucket here. 
So what they ended up with was bullion, which is a mixture of gold and silver. If you get the bullion and want to make an ingot out of it, you have to heat it up to 1,064 degrees to melt gold, um, maybe probably a little bit higher, and then pour it into these molds, about a million dollars worth. And it's pretty heavy. <sighs> Actually, this is lead. And uh, unfortunately, you can't trust people to leave this amount of gold lying around the place, so we use lead and it only weighs half as much as gold. You see movies of people robbing a bank and checking around these big bars of gold, they wouldn't even be able to lift them. The process was relatively efficient for oxidised ore near the surface. But as the mines passed downward into fresh rock with some sulphides, as much as 50% of the gold would be lost. The crushing systems evolved to improve the gold recovery from fresh ore. Wilfley tables were used to separate grains of gold that had other minerals still attached, because they're slightly heavier than quartz. In the sample, I've got a new Wilfley table that I found with James Wilfley in the UK. And in Australia, they call the tables use a similar action to an old gold prospector's pan. By carefully controlling the shaking action, the slope of the tables and the water flow, the heaviest grains work their way to one side of the table and the lighter quartz grains to the other side. Splitter plates were set to divide the feed into heavies, middles and tails for further processing. The heavies and middles were sent to a ball mill. It's a rotating drum lined with wear plates and filled with large steel balls. As the drum rotates, the balls grind the mineral particles to separate gold grains from other minerals. At most modern mines, huge versions of the ball mill have replaced the stamp mills entirely. After the ball mill, the finely ground minerals and some mercury were put into a badan pan. It's a large iron bowl rotating on an angled shaft. A heavy steel plug, held in place by a chain, grinds the minerals against the bottom of the bowl to expose fresh gold grains so they can amalgamate with the mercury. Eventually, cyanide extraction would replace the mercury process. In 1889, the Golden Crown mine was one of the first to use the MacArthur Forest cyanide process that had been invented in Scotland. It dramatically improved the proportion of gold recovered and allowed treatment of some discarded tailings. The early mills were powered by water wheels, but the rapidly increasing number of mills and erratic water supplies forced most of them to change to steam. The mill at the Golden Crown is currently driven by an electric motor, but the Haraki Prospectors Association has restored a couple of original steam engines that will soon be connected to bring the mill back to the golden age of steam engineering. We can already use this one to drive those, the, the two Wilfley tables, the Verdan and the... Um, yeah, the plan is to drive this one to drive the stamps. Use this big one to drive the stamps, but we've got to get a, put a shaft in. This one is 1890, that one is 1870. Hmm. And this is about a 15-inch throw and a 9-inch piston, if I'm yep. not mistaken. They showed me it and said, we're going to rebuild it. Mm. And I thought, in your dreams. I said, what are you going to do for parts? It's not all there. And they said, oh, there's bits and pieces around New Zealand and we can get stuff from the UK and come the crunch, if we can't get it, we'll go over to the foundry and make it. Steam to power the mills was generated in large boilers that were mostly fired by wood, since coal was in short supply. Grab a few bigger ones. Each boiler consumed about two cubic metres of timber every day. And you can see the effects of that on the surrounding hills in photographs from the 1870s. This is the boiler here. There are pipes all the way through there. Yeah. And how long does it take to get that ahead of steam up? Three hours. Three hours from the time yeah. you light the, yeah. the boiler. At the moment we've taken our oilers and all the brass wear off the steam engine because we had problems with somebody coming in and stealing stuff. First the steam comes to this end, pushes the piston back, then steam's injected at that end and pushes it the opposite way. Here's the governor, so the balls, as it runs faster, the balls swing out and it comes up and it cuts off the steam flow. Oh. Occasionally these things have been known to go out of control. Ooh. And uh, 
Yeah, so this belt is driving, driving the governor. If the belt breaks, does the engine will suddenly just take off and go crazy. So what it has is this, has this roller here. If the belt breaks, that roller drops down and shuts off the steam. So there you have it. If you want to come and see how gold ore was mined and processed in the good old days, this place is certainly worth a visit. They've got the mine, the processing equipment, and the steam engines that drove it all in the one place.